Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. I'm Gordon Hansen. I'm the director uh, on the, of the Center for Global Transformation at the School of Global Policy and Strategy here at UC San Diego. Uh, what our center does, and as part of its key mission, is to bring thought leaders from around the world uh, who help uh, inform research and teaching that we do on campus so that we can bring our cutting edge research to design public policies that have a tr transformative impact on planetary and societal uh, well-being. This is the 30th anniversary year for GPS, and so we paid particularly close attention inviting uh, uh, visitors to campus who represent the mission that the school has tried to achieve over the last 30 years. Uh, today we have with us Santi uh, Dr. Santiago Levy, who is a Pacific Leadership Fellow at the center and will be uh, with us on campus for this week. Um, uh, Dr. Levy has had a star-studded career that has crossed, that has bridged uh, research that has been at the forefront of understanding the process of economic development with designing policies that have changed not just uh, countries but entire regions. Uh, he obtained his PhD in economics from Boston University uh, and quickly set about uh, taking leading roles in public policy in Mexico. He was the first president of Mexico's Federal Competition Commission, which was the first entity of its kind in the country to take on the regulation of monopoly, uh, a set of issues that Mexico has had immense challenges with. If we look at the progress that Mexico has made in the last 10 years with trying to regulate anti-competitive behavior in the country, uh, that progress was made and possible by the leadership of, of Dr. Levy in getting that commission started during a very difficult time uh, politically in, in the country. Um, his most significant impact on public policy in the country came during six years when he was undersecretary of the Treasury uh, and of public credit in Mexico from 1994 to 2000. During that time, he was the brains behind the design of conditional cash transfer programs, which were, were initially known uh, under the program of Progresa, then changed to Oportunidades, and then now to Prospera, uh, with each president changing the name of a program. A sign of the success of a policy is that each president not only wants to keep it, but wants to name it after himself. Um, <laughs> What conditional cash, uh, conditional cash transfer programs do is provide incentives for family members to send their kids to school uh, and to uh, in involve their kids in public health care. Uh, and those incentives have a dual purpose. One, they ensure, uh, they ensure that kids from poor, from poor families grow up with the education and the public health that they need so they can succeed as individuals. And two, what it does is create positive spillovers throughout society by providing uh, a stronger talent base uh, that can promote economic uh, development. Um, now, the design of those policies was one thing. That was, that was an important innovation that, that Dr. Levy achieved. But the second was the way in which he implemented that policy. He did it in the way that a rigorous scientist would. And to roll that out in a randomized fashion that allowed very, very care, uh, careful evaluation of the impact of these programs on uh, the, uh, the children and the family members in the communities in which these programs were enacted. The success was landmark. Um, that program is now in its uh, 25th year, our uh, 22nd year in Mexico, and it has been emulated all around the world. It's one of the most successful anti-poverty programs that has been designed in the last uh, uh, several decades. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Levy was not done yet. Um, he moved on to head Mexico's uh, Social Security uh, Institute, EAMS, uh, to help bring modernization of the way in which Social Security is implemented uh, in the country. And for the last 10 years, he's been vice president for sector and knowledge uh, at the World Bank, at the Inter-American Development Bank. And the, the, uh, the role of his office is to help design policies that promote innovation and economic growth um, in the country. What Dr. Levy is here to talk about today, I don't know if he's going to uh, plug his book, so I will plug it before him, uh, before he gets a uh, chance to, uh, which is uh, his most recent tome on under-rewarded efforts, the uh, elusive quest for prosperity in Mexico, in which he addresses uh, this fundamental challenge that Mexico faces in terms of having done 
almost everything the country was asked of in terms of, of meeting the economic re recipe for success. That means bringing inflation down, uh, bringing public budget deficits uh, uh, in line with, uh, with sound macroeconomic management, expanding education so that the country has nearly doubled the fraction of working age adults who have a college education, expanding mortgage lending so that home ownership is available uh, uh, to um, middle and lower class households, enacting rigorous competition policy to break up monopolies that have predominated in the country uh, for decades, and to continue with a process of privatization that has now stretched into energy and electricity markets. And despite that record of success and reform, uh, Mexico's economic growth has lagged not just, inter uh, not just internationally, also within uh, Latin America, and as Dr. Levy will uh, discuss, uh, beating out over the last two decades own only Venezuela. Um, what Dr. Levy does in this book is to talk about what Mexico needs to do to realize its growth potential, which is immense. Um, he's not going to offer you a silver bullet. Uh, silver bullets aren't there for the taking. What he will do is to highlight the manner in which Mexico's social policies, Mexico's tax policies, and the way in which uh, Mexico regulates and enforces property rights have interacted to impede the development of dynamic companies that can help uh, bring Mexico to growth rates that we've seen in East Asia uh, and, and elsewhere. So over the three-decade career Dr. Levy has had, a uh, transformative impact on how we think about poverty alleviation, how we think policies, uh, think about policies that promote growth uh, and innovation. Um, we can think of no better person here to help us celebrate our 30th anniversary year, and it is my pleasure to invite him to the podium. Thank you. That was very kind. Too kind. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I want to begin by, by thanking Gordon for his very kind words. Um, I think he raised the expectations too much, so I, I have got to go do something down to bring down the expectations. Um, I also want to thank Rafael Fernandez de Castro for inviting me here to spend the, the week here at San Diego. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, so far, it's been a very, very pleasant experience. So thank you. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. So Gordon sort of said a little bit what the, what the talk is about. And what I want to do is sort of plunge into it directly. So that's the puzzle. Um, as, as Gordon was saying, if you think of any country, great, thank you. If you think of any country that has done what the check marks there are done, you would expect that country to be growing between four and a half to five percent a year. And with the exception of Venezuela, Mexico is the country of Latin America that has grown the least in the last two decades. So it's a real puzzle. Why has a country that has done almost everything well in terms of economic policy has performed so poorly? And this is what I try to explain in this book. And economists have this usual way of thinking about economic growth in which they say, look, countries grow because they accumulate capital, they invest in machinery. Countries grow because the labor force grows. Or countries grow because productivity grows. If you do this usual decomposition for Mexico, what you will find is that the problem is not with the growth of investment. The problem is not with the growth of the labor force in Mexico. The problem is that productivity growth, the efficiency with which Mexicans do things, has grown zero, literally zero, over the last two decades. It is almost, you know, when, when, when your RA comes back to you and shows you that it's grown zero, you say, look, you made a mistake. Go back and, you know, recalculate again, and then you recalculate again because it's extremely difficult to understand why a society in which education is going up, that has a free trade agreement with the United States and Canada, and that has economic stability, why can't it get its act together and raise productivity? And productivity has actually grown zero. So that's the puzzle. Why can't Mexicans be more productive? And to answer that puzzle, I sort of do two things in the book. I look at a lot of data. And then I try to interpret what the data says. So for the next 15 minutes, I really, really don't want you to think why. I just want you to walk with me for 15 minutes, 
to sort of understand what the data is saying. And then the, last, the, the second part of the talk will be to try to understand why that is going on. But first, initially, let's just sort of concentrate a little bit in what does the data have to say. And what I have in Mexico, which is unusual by Latin American standards, is I have a very, very rich data set. So I have the economic censuses for Mexico for 1998, 2003, 2008, 2013. The census is put together every five years. And the census has, in 1998, 2.6 million firms. And in 2013, 4.1 million firms. And I have data on each individual firm. This is amazing. And I know exactly how many workers each firm has. I know how much capital each firm has. I know where they're located. I know the value added. I know everything about the firm. So I have a huge database. And the Statistical Institute in Mexico aggregates firms into what economists like to call six-digit sectors. So basically, all the firms in Mexico that produce shirts will be one sector of the economy. All the firms that produce, what are these called, uh, jackets, all the firms that produce wooden furniture, all the firms that produce you know, plastic bottles. There are 691. So these are very detailed firms. And I'm only going to look at firms within the same sector. I'm going to compare how productive are firms in Mexico that produce pasta for soups with other firms that produce pasta for soups. As a matter of fact, to get a sense of how nerdish I am, there are 745 firms in Mexico that produce pasta for soups. And there are 445 firms in Mexico that produce shirts. So I'm going to compare the productivity of firms that produce shirts with firms that produce shirts, pasta with firms that produce pasta. So I have a very large database. And let me give you a picture of what the data looks like in Mexico. So the first panel here is firms. The second panel is workers. The third panel is the allocation of capital. And there are way too many numbers here, but these are the firms that have from 1 to 5 workers, from 6 to 10 workers, from 11 to 50, more than 50 workers. So here, firms are classified by the size of the firm, measured by the number of workers in the firm. And then firms in this first two column, I'm going to call formal. In the next two column, I'm going to call informal. Formal firms are going to be the firms that comply with the regulations in Mexico, pay taxes, enroll their workers with social security, and by and large, not quite, but by and large, comply with the law. Remember, this is Mexico. So, so by and large, they comply with the law. Informal firms are going to be the firms that don't register their workers with social security, don't pay their taxes. And if you look at the first panel, this is 100% of the firms. So this is 100% of 4.1 million. The first thing I want you to notice is that 92% of all firms in Mexico have less than five workers. And actually, not even 1% of all firms in Mexico have more than 50 workers, NAFTA notwithstanding. So this is a country in which the vast majority of firms are really tiny. And if you think about these columns, this is a really amazing result, which says 90% of firms in Mexico are actually firms that don't enroll their workers with Social Security, don't pay their taxes. And those firms have 55% of employment. And those firms actually take 42% of the capital stock. We tend to think of the informal sector as you know, these tiny firms with very little capital. It's partly true, but since there's so many of them, when you add it up, what this says is that a lot of Mexicans are investing in the informal sector. And a lot of Mexicans are employing workers in the informal sector. And what this says is that the informal sector is very big. You might have the image of Mexico here in San Diego with all the maquiladoras in Tijuana across the, across the border, and you know, the auto parts, and all the discussions about NAFTA and all that, of Mexico with its firms and all that. Mm -mm. That's not really Mexico. That's a part of Mexico. It's a fairly small part of Mexico if you measure it by the number of firms and by the number of workers that are there. So this is kind of just a picture of what firms look like. Message, lots of informality. Message, very small firms. Since I have the censuses for 98, 2003, 2008, and 2013, I can give you a movie, not only the picture, but a movie. 
And what does the movie says? It says that, in fact, Mexican firms got smaller over this period. Exactly the opposite of what you would have expected. And it also says that before, there were fewer informal firms than in 2013. And that, in fact, employment and investment in the formal sector grew less than employment and investment in the informal sector. Please don't ask yourself why. I'm just letting you know this is the data. This is what the data says. And this is what we find from the census data. It's interesting because you begin to ask questions sort of why you know, this data is very contrary to what I think. The next thing I do in the book is I ask myself the questions, how productive are Mexican firms? And to do this, I kind of do an exercise in which think that what I do is for each firm, I compute an index of how productive that firm is. And then if there are 745 firms that produce shirts, I compute for each of the 745 firms how productive is each firm. Then I compute the mean. And then I know which firms are below the mean and which firms are above the mean. Everybody with me? To the right of the mean, more productive firms. To the left of the mean, less productive firms. So this is a comparison between firms in the US and firms in Mexico. In the US, the most productive firms, you know, this is the right tail, very few firms here. All the dots make up the distribution, very few firms here. But in the US, the more productive firms approximately are four times more productive than the average. And in the US, the least productive firms are about 1 16th less productive than the average. So even in the United States, you know, firms that produce shirts, there's some firms that are more productive and some firms that are less productive. Not all firms are equally productive. And there's a distribution of productivities. But in Mexico, the most productive firms are 16 times, not four times, 16 times more productive than the average. And the least productive firms are about 1 over 256. That's a very small number. 1 over 256, least productive than the average. So what this says is that for reasons that we need to understand, in Mexico as opposed to the United States, very unproductive firms coexist in the market with very productive firms. In the United States as well, but a lot less. And it says that there are a lot of firms here, because imagine if all the firms that are here weren't there, the Mexican distribution would look like the US distribution and the average productivity of Mexican firms would go up, and the average productivity of Mexico doesn't go up. So part of the puzzle is to understand why is it that there's so many firms here and there's so many workers there. Now I do the same movie that I showed you before, but for the whole distribution of productivity. So now blue is what happened in 1998. Red is what happened in 2013. Look at the right tail of the distribution, firms that are four or more times more productive. Look first at the right tail of the distribution. Remember that red is 2013 and blue is 98. And if you look at this area here, if you look at that area there, more firms in Mexico in 2013 are more productive than in 1998. Everybody is very happy. And you say, yeah, the country is moving right along because there are more firms in the upper tail of the productivity distribution. And if you only look at that, maybe you're looking at the NAFTA side of Mexico and the sort of export side of Mexico. But now look at this part over here. And if you look at that part over here, you get a countervailing force. Because what has happened on that part is that now it's also true that in 2013, there are more unproductive firms than in 1998. And if you then ask yourself questions as to how much capital and labor was invested in the firms on the left tail of the distribution compared to firms on the right tail of the distribution, the sad answer is, amazingly, in this period, more capital and labor of Mexico went to the left tail of the distribution than to the right tail. For some reason, Mexicans were investing more in more unproductive firms than they were investing in productive firms. Remember, macroeconomic stability, 
Remember, human capital is going up, education is going up. Remember, free trade agreement with Canada and the United States. So it's a real puzzle. Best possible circumstances, and Mexicans are deciding to invest more in the least productive firms and to contract more and hire more workers in the least productive firms. This is just data from the census. The next thing I do is the census has a very, very nice feature, which is it identifies a firm in, 1990, in say, in 2008. It puts a number on it. The firm that produces shirts, firm number 322. And then exactly the same firm, it collects data five years later for the same firm that produces shirts. So I can see the same firm and I know exactly what happened to that firm. And three things could have happened. The firm was in the 2008 census, and it was not in the 2013 census. The firm died. It went out of business. The firm was in the 2008 census, and also in the 2013 census, the firm survived. Or the firm was not in the 2008 census, but then it appeared in the 2013 census. It was a new firm. A new firm was created. So I can see firm dynamics in terms of which firms died, which survived, which entered the market, which ones grew, which got more productive, and have this data for 2 million firms. I mean, sorry, for 4 million firms. So this is fantastic. By the way, it took five years to, to, to do this book. But once you do it, you get a huge amount of understanding of what's going on. And the sad story of what goes on in Mexico is that the markets are supposed to wean out bad firms and to let good firms grow. We all know what Schumpeter said. There's a process of creative destruction. And what the markets do in a market economy is if a bad firm is there, the market will ensure that it goes out of business. And if a good firm is there, the market will reward that, bis that firm and the firm will get bigger. And that's kind of the Schumpeterian process of creative destruction. Schumpeter never put a foot in Mexico. <laughs> he, never, he never came to Mexico. What is happening in Mexico is what I call in the book a process of destructive creation. What is happening in Mexico is that many low productivity firms are surviving. Many high productivity firms are dying. And firms that enter have lower productivity than the firms that were already in the market. So it's very dysfunctional firm dynamics because there's investment and job creation in exactly the sort of firms that you don't want it to have. And this is just sort of an example. I, I'm not going to go through all the details, but this is the distribution of firms that died. This is the distribution of firms that survived. If Schumpeter had been in Mexico, the distribution of the firms that die should have been more to the left, and the distribution of the firms that survived should have been more to the right. You would have expected the mean of the distribution of the dying firms here and the mean of the distribution of the surviving firms here. So that really says that the patient really has a very bad infection, high temperature, and a really bad virus. And you can go through all the numbers, and you can see exactly who survived and who went. But basically, the point that I'm saying here is that this process in Mexico repeats year after year because firm dynamics, the process of markets cleansing the bad firms and rewarding the good firms, is actually not taking place. One last thing about what's going on, and then I'll begin to tell you a little bit about why what is going on is going on. There's a lot of discussion about Mexico, and people say, look, the reason Mexico is not growing is because it doesn't have human capital, and there's not a lot of education. So I devote a chapter in the book to look at what happened actually with human capital. And uh, some findings are interesting. First, if you compare what Mexico did, the effort in terms of schooling years, compared to Argentina, Brazil, and the countries of Latin America, Mexico's educational effort over these two decades was actually larger than the average of the region. But in addition, I put some data in the book in which I show the national and international educators of quality. And yes, it is true that if I compare Mexico with Sweden, and if I compare Mexico with Norway or with Singapore, there's a big gap in quality between Mexico and Singapore. 
But it is also true that if I compare Mexico in 1998 with Mexico in 2013, educational quality has been going up. So if the schooling of the labor force is going up and the quality of the schooling is going up, unambiguously the human capital that Mexico has at its disposal, it's going up. So we have increases in human capital, but productivity is not going up. And I really question in the book a lot of the conventional wisdom that is repeated often and often and often that what countries need to do is to invest in human capital, sit back and relax. Mexico is a perfect tanker example that if you just do that, it will actually not work. I do something else in the book, which I want to take a minute to describe because it's really interesting. You might say, look, you know, there might be some scarcity of the really talented people. The guys that come from the top, top, top schools must be really in excess demand because there's no human capital. So what I do in the book is I look at the distribution of earnings of people with university education and the distribution of earnings of people with high school education. And I only look at the very right tail, at the top, top guys, University of San Diego and whatnot, right? The top, top guys. I only look at that. And I ask myself the question, are the real wages of the top people in 2015 higher than in 1996? If there was scarcity of human capital, you would expect that the wages in 2015 should be higher than in 1996, because the market is, you know, people are fighting for this top quality wise. And the, the answer is, the real wages in 2015 are exactly the same that in 1996, even for the top part of the distribution. So human capital is not what is causing what I was describing earlier. And then I do something else. I say, look, what happens in a society that is educating its labor force continuously. It's investing a lot of education. But as I showed you earlier, its firms are not growing. They're getting smaller. They're getting more informal. And many, many unproductive firms are surviving. And I show data in the book that says that informal firms are less intensive and educated than formal firms. This might sound like a real you know, tongue twister. But I'll give you a very simple example. And you'll, you'll see the point. Think of tortillas. Can't think of any other product from Mexico as tortillas, right? So, tortillas can be produced by very, very small firms in Mexico with two, three workers, Molinos and Ixtamal, you know, very simple production of tortillas. There are two, three workers there. All the workers really need is to know how to read and write. And the technical process for producing tortillas with those little processes is really simple. And you can also produce tortillas with very large, sophisticated firms. For those of you from, from Mexico, Maseca and Minza, that are huge firms with very sophisticated production processes. Actually, they're multinationals. They have plants here in California, they have plants in China. So what happens if Mexico produces tortillas with these big firms? They need engineers. They need accountants. They need technical people. They need computer programmers. But what happens if Mexico produces tortillas only with very simple molinos de nixtamal? They don't really need a lot of engineers. So think of a society that is producing ever more number of university graduates, high school graduates. So on the supply side, human capital is going up. But on the demand side, these guys are entering the labor market and knock, knock, knock. A tortilleria chiquitita of Nixtamal. There are not sufficient number of firms. In that society, what's going to happen is that the returns to education are going to fall. So this is the difference between somebody that has university education and somebody that has incomplete primary education. In 1996, somebody that had university education and incomplete primary education, the guy with university education earn 120% more in principle than a guy with incomplete primary education. 20 years later, the difference was only 80%. It's a very sad story because the fact that the returns to education are coming down when the quality and the quantity of education is going up is telling you that in the labor market, people are not getting the returns. And this is partly the title of the book. 
on their rewarded efforts. It's the title of a society that has made huge efforts, and all these efforts are being under-rewarded. So let me summarize what is going on and then spend a little bit of time trying to discuss why what is going on is going on. So first big stylized fact is too much investment and too much employment in informal firms. Economic activity very dispersed. Average size in Mexico, 4.2 workers, really tiny firms. I didn't speak about it for reasons of time. Lots of people self-employed. And by the way, I don't want to depress you, but I should mention this. The census data does not include any of the activity in the streets. All the people in the Tianguis, all the people parking your car when you go drive to Mexico City, all the people cleaning your windshield, and all the people cleaning your shoes are not in this data. So economic activity is very dispersed. Schumpeter never put a foot in Mexico. The market is not cleaning this, it's worsening this. And yes, and this is another part of under-rewarded efforts. As Gordon was saying, we carried out privatization reforms. We carried out NAFTA. Policymakers for the last two decades in Mexico have been investing heavily in reforms and reforms, trying to make the rate of growth of Mexico go up. And this didn't improve. And all this happened while the quantity and quantity of human capital was going up. So let me spend a little bit of time telling you a story of what explains this. Before I plunge into that, an important observation. You might not buy the, the story that I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes. That's fine. Please separate that from not buying the stylized facts that I just presented to you in the last 15 minutes. Those are the things that we need to explain. And if we want to understand why Mexico doesn't grow, we need to explain those facts. My explanation might not be the right one, but what is important is to center the debate, to discipline the debate, and to focus on what needs to be explained, and not to disperse oneself all over the place with, ah, es la educación, es esto, es el otro, and it's the flavor of the week. What we need to understand is why what is going on is going on. So, this is the only technical slide, a little bit of technical slide. I'll walk you through it, and then I'm, I'm, I'm. So economic activity doesn't take place in the vacuum. That only occurs in EC 101, in your micro course. But in real life, economic activity takes place in countries that have institutions, laws. And what I try to do in the book is I ask myself, why do Mexican entrepreneurs and why do Mexican workers behave the way they behave? Why are they investing in these small firms? If you rule out the hypothesis that they're all stupid, and you say, no, no, these people aren't stupid. You know, the people are smart. These people are responding to a set of incentives. Then the challenge is to understand those incentives. So I say, look, the incentive structure in Mexico, the environment of Mexico, that's the E for the environment, has to do with the environment for labor, and has to do with how social insurance works in Mexico, how minimum wages are set in Mexico, whether workers can be hired or not fired, and how those regulations work, how the labor courts work. So every time that firms and workers interact, there's a, comp a big set of institutions that are in that interaction. In the US, it's difficult to understand that, because in the US, you have the immense advantage that the institutions that regulate relations between workers and firms are very light, and the regulations that are involved there are fairly light. But if you think of Mexico, and you think about the labor courts in Mexico, and you think about the Mexican Social Security Institute, the EAMS, and you think about the Mexican Housing Institute, pretty much the provision of health, housing, daycare, access to justice is all intermediated through the labor market, through labor institutions. So that's L. Then Mexicans face taxes. And their, their taxes on firms, their taxes on workers, their value-added taxes. And as we will describe in a minute, there are regimes for firms in which the taxes on firms depend on the size of the firm. So that's the world of, the world of taxation. And then markets, for markets to work well, 
people need to trust the institutions that are going to enforce contracts in the market. If I sell something to Gordon, I need to trust that Gordon's going to pay me back. And otherwise, I need to trust that if Gordon doesn't pay me back, I'll sue him, and then a court will force him to pay me back. Otherwise, I won't sell to Gordon. And if a bank is going to lend to a company, it needs to trust that the contract is going to be enforced. So I look about the contracts. So this is the environment where Mexican lives. 50 million people every day look at labor institutions, tax institutions, or market institutions, and they make their decisions on the basis of that. So what I need to explain now is what is it about the environment in Mexico that induces people to behave in the way that I described earlier? And that's the second half of the book. So I'm going to go really just a big uh, pass, because this is sort of dense, and I don't want to make it super dense. If you read the Mexican Constitution, by the way, the first constitution written in the 20th century, at the time of the Russian Revolution, the Mensheviks were getting the Tsar out, and the Mexicans were signing their constitution, literally in February of 1917. Marx, Marxism, all this stuff. The Mexican Constitution makes a big distinction between workers that are salaried and workers that are non-salaried. These guys have a boss, a firm. These guys might be self-employed. Or they can work together in a firm, but there's no boss. The typical firm in Mexico is a firm in which papa, mama, the cousin, and the sobrino of the cousin, the nephew of the cousin. 70% of firms in Mexico are family firms. In those firms, all the regulations about minimum wages, all the regulations about not being able to fire workers do not apply. In these firms, all those regulations apply. In addition, in these firms, the firm and the worker must pay for the social insurance of the worker. This is not American social security. Social insurance in Mexico is your pension, your health, your daycare center, your access to housing, your access to cultural facilities, to a whole bunch of things. Over here, they pay 30% for that. Over here, that is provided free by the government. So if your firm is here, the firm has to internalize in the contract 30% of the value of the wage to pay for all these benefits. But if your firm is here, the government will say, we will give you health insurance for free, and we will give you a pension for free. I know you're looking at me like, Santiago, you're nuts. But if you really sort through the laws in Mexico, I've been thinking about this issue for the last 12 years. If you really think about what is happening in Mexico, the laws actually are actually saying, this is subsidized, this is taxed. So what firms will do is they will try to avoid this, and they will try to be like this. Think of a family firm. The father, the mother, the cousin, perhaps another helper. They make profits, and at the end of the month, profit sharing, or maybe the papa, you know, big boss, somehow distributes the money among, among them. There are no wages. Suppose that firm is doing really well. They want to grow. Maybe they make shoes you know, in Guanajuato, in zapatos, and their firm wants to grow. Bring in another cousin. And suppose they're really doing really, really well. What do they want to do? Bring in yet another cousin. But after the firm is eight workers, nine workers, there are not that many cousins. If you really want to grow, you've got to structure yourself as a firm like this in which you hire workers and you, know, you pay them a salary and they come to work. But the jump from going to here to here increases your labor cost by 30%. And if you have workers here, it turns out you can't fire them. If you have workers here, you can. Because the Mexican labor law does not recognize that adjustments in demand or technical change 
are legal reasons to be able to fire a worker. This is not the US. This is not you give them a pink sleep, slip and then they go and you know, collect unemployment insurance. These workers will take you to court and the court might award them to bring you back five years. So the labor environment and the social insurance environment is telling you've got to be a firm like that and in fact if you're a firm like that you're subsidized because a lot of the benefits for those workers will be for free. In Mexico we spend 1.7% of GDP providing free health insurance and free pensions to workers as long as they're non-salaried or as long as they break the law. Because all these provisions are for workers who don't get social security from here. Willy-nilly, the Mexican government's desire to provide health for everybody and pensions for everybody, what it's really doing is rewarding illegal behavior and is rewarding inefficient behavior. So that's that world. Then I look in the book at taxes on consumption. I don't have time to go through everything, but I want to describe this a little bit because this is a particular feature of Mexico and many countries in Latin America. The tax code in Mexico says the following. If you're a firm that sells up to 2 million pesos a year, roughly $100,000 a year. If you're a firm with sales up to 2 million pesos a year, your tax is 2% of your sales. If you're a firm with sales of more than 2 million pesos a year, your tax rate is 30% of profits. Okay? 2% of sales, 30% of profits. The Mexican government designed this in all its wisdom because it said, we want to promote small firms. You know, they, small firms create jobs and blah, blah, blah. Now think of the firm that is selling 1,999,999 pesos. The firm is paying 2% of taxes on sales. A new client comes to the firm and says, I like your products. You know, I like your shirts. I'd like to buy more of your shirts. What is a firm going to do? Correct. It's not going to grow. Because if it grows and it sells 2 million one peso, its tax burden is going to go up so much that actually the firm is going to be worse off after it pays taxes. And in the book, I show some simulations in which I show that for most firms that are at this borderline, growing brings negative profits. It doesn't pay for them to grow. And then think of a firm that is in this special regime and in addition has non-salaried workers. That firm doesn't have to pay social security, only pays 2% of taxes, and it's perfectly legal. It can be very unproductive, but it's perfectly legal. Mexico's problem is not so much the la loose enforcement of regulations that worsen things. Mexico's problem is that the policy design is flawed. Because the policy design is trying to redistribute income through the labor market and redistribute income through taxation in ways that are very perverse. Yet another way in which Mexico tries to do that is through the value-added tax. Mexico says, look, we can't put value-added taxes on foods and medicines because these are really important things and the poor people couldn't pay the value-added tax on food and medicine. And to redistribute income towards the poor people, let's exempt food and medicine from value-added taxes. But now think that you're a firm here. You sell less than 2 million pesos. And in addition, you produce food. Oh, fantastico. No taxes on input, no value-added tax on output, no tax on, um, on only 2% tax on sales. And by the way, no withholding of income taxes here and withholding of income taxes here. So the tax regime interacting 
with the, tax, with the labor regime is actually going to reward unproductive firms and is actually going to punish productive firms and this sort of repeat. I'm going to skip this. There's a section of the book in which I talk about how imperfect enforcement of contracts starves firms of credit. This is also part of the story as to why firms don't grow. Banks are very reluctant to give credit to firms because the contract environment is not very good. But um, let me skip that and let me just tell you a little bit about why Mexico's caught in a really, really bad situation. So I've got to remind you who this is. Homer, the poem, The Odyssey, he wrote um, L'Iliada and Odyssea. So in the Iliad, um, Armagenon goes to, to Troy. They win over the Trojans. The Greeks are victorious. And in the second poem, he's returning back to his house. But he takes a long detour through the Aegean Mar Sea. His wife is waiting for him, Penelope, and has a lot of suitors. All these guys, they say, look, you know, the king probably died in Troy. Marry one of us. And Penelope says, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, knit. Knit. I'm going to knit this uh, sweater. And when I finish knitting it, I will decide who of you I'm going to marry. And what Penelope would do is he would knit during the day. And then at night, he wouldn't knit. <laughs> and it never went anywhere. Penelope did come to Mexico. <laughs> so this is what we celebrate all the time. We celebrate the free trade agreements. We have more free trade agreements than any other country in Latin America. Our exports of manufactured goods are larger than the sum of the exports of manufactured goods of all Latin American countries put together. We promote foreign investment. We spend a lot of time doing financial and sectoral reforms. We get together in Los Pinos, you know, the, the Mexican White House. Rafael has been there, I've been there. Big, you know, meetings there, the president in the middle, all these people here, all these people there. And, you know, we promote the reform of this, the reform of that, pictures, you know, congratulations. We do that all the time. We try to invest in research and development and labor training. During the day, we're really trying to increase productivity in Mexico and to make Mexico a more productive and prosperous country. But then during the night, what we do is say, ah, let me tax salaried labor at the rate of 3% of GDP, and let me not tax non-salaried labor. Aha, uh -huh. let me tax big firms and not tax the real small firms. And let me give everybody free health insurance as long as they're non-salaried, as long as they're informal, or as long as they're illegal. And in addition, let me give pensions to all these people that don't have pensions. And in addition, blah, 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 blah. So that's what we do at night. The net effect of this over the last two decades has been stagnant productivity. The distributions of productivity that I showed you earlier are just a reflection of a social process and a political process of a society that is subject to very contradictory forces. It is not that Mexicans are dumb. They're very smart. It is not that they're lazy. By the way, the second country with the longest working hours in the OECD is Mexico. Mexicans work more hours than the Americans. It is not that they don't know how to read and write because the educational population has improved substantially. It is that the incentives, the environment that they're facing from all these policies on social insurance, on labor, on taxes, and on contracts are inducing to make all these choices that don't go well. So let me make some concluding observations. Um, if you ask, why has prosperity looted Mexico? The technical answer is that my generation of economists, those of us who were working since the 1994 crisis, you know, after the, the tequila crisis over the last two decades, we've been involved in policy making. We thought wrongly 
that what we had to do was to stabilize the economy, open the economy, invest in human capital, and that this would bring prosperity to Mexico. You know, get rid of monopolies. We substantially underestimated the incentives coming from all the set of policies that are here. At the end of the day, what this does is it taxes the high productivity sector of the economy, and then it turns around and it subsidizes the low productivity sector of the economy. Of course, that's the technical answer. The deeper answer, which makes this problem very complex, as Gordon was saying in the introduction, there are going to be no silver bullets from here. The deeper answer is that this reflects very deeply held beliefs about how labor should be regulated, as reflected in the Mexican Constitution. Very bad equilibrium as to how to tax. And a lot of malfunctioning institutions in the judiciary that make contract enforcement very costly and make credit not work very well and contracts not work very well. So a deeper reflection is that this environment E is really the product of a society that is deeply concerned about inequality and is deeply concerned about poverty. In Mexico, we don't have these big debates like in the United States. Should the government provide health insurance or not? Nobody questions in Mexico really whether the government should provide health insurance. And nobody questions in Mexico whether the government should provide pensions and housing and daycare centers. There's a very strong commitment to fighting inequality and to reducing poverty. The problem with Mexico is that the means that we're using to pursue all those ends are the wrong means. We think that we have to be special tax regimes for small, small firms because we say there's a lot of job creation and because small entrepreneurs are low income entrepreneurs and what we need to do is help the low income entrepreneurs. And Rafael is here, he understands Mexico better than I do. How many politicians in Mexico should go to Congress and say, it is high time that we tax small firms? We say, no, we're going to subsidize small firms because that's where the jobs are being created. But nobody makes the connection here with this side of the brain, with the other side of the brain, like Penelope, nobody makes the connection that what you're really saying is, let us subsidize unproductive jobs and let us subsidize the creation of jobs in which no engineers or computer programmers are needed, and let us subsidize the jobs in which only people with reading and writing abilities are required. Because that's what they're really saying when they're saying that. And when they say, look, let's give everybody health insurance, nobody's going to Congress to say, let's reward illegal behavior and let's reward unproductive firms. What they're really saying is, all Mexicans should have access to health insurance. But the means of saying, I give you health insurance and you pay for it if you're salaried, and I give it to you for free if you're not salaried, that combination is not put together. And similarly, you know, there are zillions of speeches by Mexican politicians as to why there should be no taxes on consumption of food and medicines and, and all this. So what these policies do is, even though they're pursuing distributive aims and they're pursuing attempts to lower poverty and inequality, they're really making productivity to be stagnant. So that's my last slide. I want to walk through through this last slide because I think this last slide is really, really important. The mantra of Washington is growth with social inclusion. That's what everybody wants, growth with social inclusion. So this is growth on this axis, this is social inclusion on this axis. Maybe Mexico was able to grow fast without social inclusion in the 60s and 70s, when we were not a very democratic society and which inequality could perhaps be tolerated much more than it is tolerated today. So maybe in the 60s we could grow without social inclusion. Fortunately for Mexico, 
Mexican society does not tolerate that anymore. Mexican society wants social inclusion. So what we're trying to do since then is to increase social inclusion. To increase social inclusion through all the policies that I've described before, very summarily, but to try to do that to increase social inclusion. What people don't realize is that those policies are incompatible with high growth. So this is unreachable. The main message of under-rewarded efforts is that unless there's a drastic change in the institutions and the incentives of Mexico, Mexico's never going to grow fast with social inclusion. Mexico's on the root of being a society in which social inclusion is increasing without growth. As demography comes down, growth will slow down in Mexico. And then the real question for Mexico is going to be whether this equilibrium is a sustainable equilibrium. It's a society in which everything is done through the redistribution and the society is not growing, in which productivity is stagnant, a society that can be prosperous. And I think we're heading that way. My own answer to that is no. And I think that's why it's important to really try to change this. So I stop there. Thank you.